homes, they are at three times the usage that they were previous to the start of COVID-19. And I saw another Microsoft person tweet, there are now six times more users of Windows Virtual Desktop than we expected to have by the end of 2020. So that's another one you're like, wow. You say to your average corporation, you think you have capacity planning issues. Imagine what these guys have. Mobile workforces, cloud applications, and digitalization are changing every aspect of the modern enterprise. And with radical transformation come new business risks. Welcome to Hybrid Identity Protection, the premier podcast for cybersecurity pros charged with defending hybrid identity environments. Presented by Semperis, the pioneers of identity-driven cyber resilience for the hybrid enterprise. And now, here's your host, 15-time Microsoft MVP and Active Directory Security Expert, Sean Duby. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the HIP Podcast. Today, I'm especially pleased to welcome my friend, Mary Jo Foley, to the podcast. Mary Jo is a legend in tech journalism. She's covered the tech industry for more than 30 years for a variety of publications and sites. She's the editor of ZDNet's All About Microsoft blog, and she is also the co-host with my former Windows IT Pro colleague, Paul Perrott, of the Windows Weekly podcast on the Twit Network. I think there are about two or three IT pros that don't listen or watch their weekly podcast. And I'm admitting on the record that I'm one of them. Now, Mary Jo (laughs) knows this, but now we actually have this, uh, we have this on the record. She and I bonded over craft beer at RERA in Las Vegas many years ago with Paul. And whenever I make it to New York City, we go off and uh, visit her favorite haunts. She knows all the cool places. So Mary Jo, it's great to have you. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Great to be here virtually. Yeah, virtually. (laughs) The same place as always, uh, walking around, walking around the same few steps, but uh, virtually <laughs> projecting yourself into another location. Exactly. Well, you know, it, for today's topic, you know, given your unique qualifications and your insight into Microsoft and what's obviously we're all dealing with right now, uh, I think it would be really great to uh, sort of get a feel for how Mike, how you think Microsoft itself is handling this you know, fantastic increased load to their infrastructure. Um, mm-hmm. Frank Shaw, the I would think he's the, what do you call him, the general spokesman and the head of communications mm-hmm. for Microsoft said on Twitter that uh, recently they had 200 million meeting participants in a single day and that they averaged mm-hmm. 75 million daily active users. That's just crazy. Yeah, and that's just on Teams, right? <laughs> yeah. So... I know. That's just like one of the many Microsoft services that they've had to really ramp up and scale up because of what's going on with COVID. Um, their team's growth, you know, Frank's Frank's tweet, um, it's been growing like at this crazy pace that's almost uh, unimaginable, right? Before COVID started, they had something like 20 million Teams users, daily active users. Um about two weeks into it, they have 44 million. And this week, 75 million. I mean, it's just the growth path is just like, woo, right? And and they were already scaling up for teams to grow, but I don't think they could have in any way, just like every every other big tech company, anticipated what was going to happen. I think it's interesting that, you know, you're still seeing the promo stuff like, hey, you can be using Teams instead of Zoom. And I'm wondering about everybody in the background going, no, 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 that's okay. Take your time. <laughs> I uh, I worked for Global Foundation Services back in the day. I'm not sure what it's called anymore, but they're the ones that are responsible for making this infrastructure work. And mm-hmm. there are a lot of squirrels and a lot of cages there to make this go. I can't imagine what this is like behind the scenes. Oh, definitely. And, you know, Teams is one of the big kind of um, poster children for Azure, right? Teams runs on Azure. And so you have to kind of step back and say, okay, how's Azure doing? Like Teams is growing exponentially. Email use is up at Microsoft. Office 365 use is up. So, you know, how how is Azure doing? Because that's kind of the, the base level uh, and the backbone of everything. And I would say overall it's doing well. Like if I was going to grade Microsoft on it, I'd say I'd give them like a B minus. Um, and the reason I wouldn't give them an A is they've been, and this is understandable, but they've been hitting capacity constraints with Azure as demand has ramped up. So that that first manifested in Europe, 
right when COVID started becoming really widespread, uh, I was hearing on Twitter from a lot of European customers that they couldn't even spin up a VM. They're like, what's going on? Like, I, I literally cannot see the Azure resource management portal. I can't spin mm -hmm. up a VM. Mm -hmm. And at first, Microsoft wasn't really copping to this, right? They were saying, no, no, it's because they have a free account or it's because of this or that. And finally, they came out and admitted, yeah, you know what? There's a lot of demand and we're trying our best to balance it. Of course, we're going to try to add more servers in our data centers as we can. But even that is problematic because Microsoft gets a lot of their um, components for their data center servers from Asia and their Asian supply chains have been fraught with problems like everyone mm -hmm. else's. So mm -hmm. they haven't been able to get the components they need to build more servers, to put in more data centers. And so as demand has ramped up, they've been hitting capacity levels um, in a number of countries, not just Europe, um, not just European countries, but I've seen people in Africa complaining, I've seen people in um, the Middle East complaining. And, and sometimes Microsoft will just say to them, you know what? Okay, this data center, we, we're out of capacity, but why don't you use the one over here? And a lot of customers will say, yeah, but that one's more expensive or that one's a lot further away from me. And I'm worried about latency issues because of that. Right, right. Makes me wonder about, um, well, and, and it is, you're talking about, I'm first proceeding with the, the, the party line of there, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, yeah, well, you know, it is kind of an unusual time. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> And, and, and seeing as a Teams user, which we use every day, seeing them say, hey, you know what? Some things are just not going to work right now and you mm -hmm. better be, you know, just, and that's why, which makes a ton of sense. I mean, it does. we are trained to think of the cloud as this infinite resource, but I have this favorite little, you know, meme, meme uh, JPEG that basically says the cloud is your stuff on someone else's computer. Mm -hmm. So, which is the truth. It is. And, and, yep. and other, someone else's computer is really, really busy right now. Exactly. And it, it, yeah, to your point about them having to throttle some services, a lot of people say, oh, I'm not even noticing this because, and, and that's good because they're trying to thr throttle what they consider to be quote, non-essential capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. So things like OneNote and Teams, some people yes. in, the, in EDU especially have been having trouble syncing. Um, people who are using the, the stream video service have noticed different things happening or some, some people can't see presence in teams and all of these right. things are Microsoft making choices and deciding, making trade-offs, right. That about, we've got to throttle some things to keep the main services working and to make sure we can especially address the needs of healthcare workers and first responders. So they they have to make decisions and, Right now, it feels like to me, based on a few conversations I've had recently, that EDU is kind of getting squeezed. Everybody's doing remote learning, not just working mm. from home. Mm -hmm. And uh, those those tenants are feeling the brunt of some of these throttling uh, situations. Interesting. I think as I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is that makes me wonder how uh, the Azure AD team is doing for capacity. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. everything goes through that. It does. And <laughs> And the other is, you know, just the general broader trend of cloud services adoption there, you know, I spent a lot of time as a consultant talking to companies and a lot of them stayed on the fence and they were like, yeah, we'll examine it. We'll take our time. Mm -hmm. We have a small footprint. We haven't done very much, or we're all going in through VPN and we're doing a little bit of office 365. And all of a sudden, my opinion is people, people are getting a good kick in the but to get kicked off the fence because they need it right now, right away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take the decisions that you've made and the plans that you have, and we are implementing right now. So from a Microsoft point of view, all of a sudden, as you said, boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's set exactly. this up. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, the, another number they shared besides the 75 million teams number was Office 365 commercial. So those are the business plans are mm. now at 258 million paid seats. So every one of those seats has to authenticate through Active Directory. That's how you do single sign-on with Office 365. So that means all of those 250 million paid seats are going through Azure Active Directory, right? Right. <laughs> and and they re-authenticate every hour. Yeah. 
So, <laughs> so yeah, I would love to see that dashboard. Yeah, that would be fascinating. I know. And the other service I was thinking about too is uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, right? Their virtualization service, which is another big Azure service. They are at what was the number they gave? Three times the usage uh, that they were previ previous to the start of COVID-19. And I saw another Microsoft person tweet, there are now six times more users of Windows Virtual Desktop than we expected to have by the end of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another one you're like, wow, they, they have to be killing themselves to keep that thing up, right? That's forecasts all out the window and the yeah, and the capacity so you say to your average corporation you think you have capacity planning issues imagine what these guys have exactly right and then you know when people were complaining about azure capacity constraints microsoft said you know we have forecasting algorithms and we obviously monitor those and adjust them as we can but no one could have anticipated this so I, we're not saying it, sorry it, sorry, are bad, but we're also saying, you know what, what we're doing our best, and we can only adjust the algorithm so fast. Right, and and all the and what they don't say because that's not what you say in communications is all things considered, we're doing pretty damn good. Thank you very much. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I think they are saying that internally, but they don't want to say it externally because any customer you say that to who is hitting constraints, they're like, yeah, yeah. that's good, but what about me? Right. Yeah, they don't want to. They don't want to hear that. <laughs> no. Actually, in the midst of all of this, Alex Simons announced a whole raft of Azure AD uh, improvements, new features, uh, existing features becoming generally available. One of the biggest bunches of announcements I've ever seen, including uh, a couple that are really quite significant and people have been waiting for for a long time. So, The single sign-on one are you referring to? That yeah, well, I'm yeah. referring to what has been variously called token lifetime or session mm -hmm. freshness, basically addressing the problems of because this is all based on OAuth 2 and OAuth 2 uses an access token that's checked once an hour by protocol. Mm -hmm. um, if someone is in the office and they've just authenticated and then they close their notebook and they go to a Starbucks and they log on, um, they still have a valid access token. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Azure AD doesn't know that they've changed environments. Maybe they have something that says everybody that's outside the office has to get MFA. Mm -hmm. But if they close it and they go to Starbucks when the, within an hour, they won't, um, Azure AD won't know it. Mm -hmm. And that's a really tough problem to solve. And Microsoft has been working on it for quite a while. And what they have come up with is making uh, the office applications smarter. Mm -hmm. So the office applications will actually communicate back to Azure AD. Mm -hmm. It's not, okay. it's not fully rolled out yet. Um, if every, all the tenants uh, that have conditional access don't use it, but if you don't you do any conditional access uh, for teams in exchange, for example, if you do that type scenario where you change your environment, suddenly um, you will, Azure AD will catch that and it'll mm -hmm. trigger identity protection or MFA or, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, so that's, that's, that's pretty powerful. And it's been, they've been working on it for quite a while. Mm. I also saw he announced um, Azure AD single sign-on for an, an unlimited number of cloud apps for no extra cost. I saw a lot of people yeah. retweeting that one as well. Yep. And that, that's, that's really related popular. to MFA also, right? Well, yes and no. The I mean, the free plan for Azure AD allowed you to, um, which is what happens if you get Office 365 and you don't pay any attention to the fact that you just got an Azure AD tenant. You got up to ten. Uh, you got up to ten uh, client, ten applications that you could integrate for mm -hmm. single sign-on. Mm -hmm. So what they've done is they've made it. They've made it for everything. Okay. So that's great. If if the people if customers know to take advantage of it and they know how to do application integration. Yeah. That's a, that's a really great thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it was amazing. Like you said, he, he announced all these new features and by the way, this is in the middle of a pandemic. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly they, they felt like, you know, they had to double down on some of these, some of these features and get that were important to remote workers. Um, one of them, for example, is, uh, and you actually, you gave me this link about, the best ways to configure conditional access mm -hmm. for remote workers. And what they did was they, um, 
they updated some guidance and some what if scenarios. So you can actually set, you can, you set up conditional access policies and then you can what if them and get it's in a more advanced way that you used to be able to do before so that you don't necessarily shoot your workers in the foot in a hurry to get this, to get this stuff out. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, Nitika Gupta was on, is one of the people on the team to do that. So that's the, um, it's going to be welcomed. I've not had a chance to look at it deeply. I've had mm-hmm. a chance to look at it some, and it's a real, it's a great improvement. So these mm-hmm. are not trivial things that they've just kind of rolled out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, a lot of the things they've been announcing lately across all of Microsoft are things that they've been working on for months or, or longer. Right. I, I feel what like a lot is- of the, a lot of the Ignite announcements um, mm-hmm. that they did around um, improving security for first line workers um, and, and things along those lines, those all just started showing up in preview um, in the past couple of weeks too. What else do you think that, what else have they talked about that is more enterprise focused that I know, you know, you, you, uh, you cover a lot of, you cover a lot of ground on Windows Weekly and what sort of enterprise or, you know, enterprise security things are covered? I've shown up. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the security specific ones. Nothing is coming readily to mind. And the reason is we have um, on ZDNet where I do most of my blogging, we have two other people who write every Microsoft security announcement before Mm. I get to ever write them because they're more kind of in the vein of that's that side of the house. Sure. Um, Sure. Yeah. I, you know, on the enterprise side, one of the, one of the interesting things I, this isn't necessarily directly security related, but it kind of opens up my my brain to thinking about what could be the security angles. Is uh, Microsoft just announced some new five G edge computing um, capabilities in Azure mm-hmm. that they're starting to turn on, and they're working with a lot of the telcos and communications companies for this. So you know they they talk a lot about the importance of end to end security and the last mile of security the 5G you know the mm-hmm. end the end where 5G is implemented and i think that they're starting to get really serious about this as more and more companies are looking to do 5G based iot workloads so they've got this thing that they call Azure edge zones that they announced. And they're starting to roll these out over the summer in U S cities like Los Angeles, Miami, and New York. Um, and AT&T is the main partner for Microsoft in a lot of this, but, but they're starting to go all across the world to implement these Azure edge, edge zones. And they're going to be talking about how edge zones can combine with some of their IOT services, including Azure sphere, which is their secure microcontroller service that's built on top of Linux. So they're mm. they're kind of um, going all out to the edge right now and talking a lot. You know, they always talk about the intelligent cloud, the intelligent edge. They're very very focused on the edge right now. And I think as we go towards build in a couple of weeks, we're going to hear more about what they're going to do with and for developers around edge computing. And I'm sure security will be one of the big big angles there. So the idea is to keep things secure in Azure services until the last mile is what exactly the right. intelligent edge. Right. And then work with the partners to make sure they even get that last mile, you know, by collaborating with them on these Azure edge, secure Azure edge zones. Well, thank you, Mary Jo. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us on the hybrid identity protection podcast with Sean Duby. Be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. Visit hipconf.com, that's H-I-P-C-O-N-F.com to learn about upcoming events, view expert presentations, and take part in the conversation. 